Before I um, introduce our distinguished uh, guest, I'd like to welcome Marguerite Serres, who's the Managing Director of ESB Networks, to give just some introductory remarks. You'll be aware that um, this breakfast briefing is part of the ESB's Powering the Future uh, lecture series, and we're always en enormously ha happy to have an opportunity to have ESB uh, address us here and to be present, and they're huge supporters uh, for this series of lectures. I want to thank the ESB again for that, and welcome, Marguerite. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, everyone, and as the Chairman says, it's great to see so many people here so early this morning. Uh, we're a little bit later starting than we thought, but I'm sure people were here very promptly. Uh, on behalf of ESB, I'd love to really welcome, first of all, her uh, guest of honour, Julia Ham, who's come here today to speak to us, and I'm sure is going to give us a lot of food for thought, but also to thank yourselves for coming here this morning as well. It's a, a great pleasure to, to have this uh, Powering the Future lecture uh, on behalf of ESB. My day job is to manage ESB networks, and uh, that means, I suppose, among other things, one of our licenses is to be the distribution system operator in uh, the Republic of Ireland. And traditionally, um, that role was fairly easy to explain, if not always easy to execute. And it effectively meant that our job was to connect up new customers and then to keep the lights on and to do that as economically as possible. Now, the network has grown because of that organically uh, over the last 90 years. And, um, you know, it, it has built up in line with demand and I think largely has served us very, very well. But it was built for a particular set of circumstances and it was built in a particular time and that has all changed now. So typically in the past, I suppose, what we had were quite high voltage lines leaving a small number of generating stations, effectively big wires, big conductors. And then that would taper its way down through the various voltage levels until it reached uh, customer premises where it entered at obviously much lower voltages and much smaller lines. So a lot of tapering from big down to little. We typically had currents flowing in only one direction and we typically also had very predictable loads, so we knew based on yesterday or based on last month or based on the same time last year typically what load levels would look like, so it was very predictable. Now, as you know, that's all changing, and generators can effectively pop up anywhere and tend to. They actually tend to be more at the more remote ends of our network, at the very end of those tapered networks, and that gives us an awful lot of challenges to system operators because now what we have are unpredictable load flows. We don't, can't predict today what's going to happen versus what happened yesterday. Uh, we have to remote uh, the network that is very remote, we have to reinforce, and that's not particularly popular, I suppose, with landowners and customers at times. And uh, while we're trying to do that and connect up the new generators, we also need to make sure that we don't adversely affect existing customers. So there's a lot of challenges in there, and it's a complex mix. And really, again, what we have to do, despite all those new challenges, obviously, is to keep the lights on. So it's not an easy balance, I suppose, and it's getting more complex. But because of that, in ESB networks and in ESB in general, we have been investing heavily in both the transmission and the distribution grids over the last two decades to make sure that we can accommodate the increasing levels of renewable generation. And it is quite significant. I think we were just talking over breakfast there. Um, the peak in the Republic of Ireland last year was just under 5,000 megawatts. And by the end of 2017, we'll have about 4,000 megawatts of renewables connected. And we have a, a queue of lots more wind and about three and a half gigawatts of solar. So there's a lot of interest in renewables and a lot of demands for it. But for the next hour or so, I suppose we can forget uh, all about those realities that I've been talking about, and I suppose maybe indulge in the luxury of a blank page and what we would do if we could start now unencumbered totally by our history, in our case, 90 years of it, and consider how we would design a network from scratch and indeed how we would design legacy uh, or ignore our legacy market systems and how we would design market systems. Julia's organisation, she just told me they've changed the name of it. I had the Solar Electric Power Alliance, but I think now it's the Smart Electric Power Alliance, or SEPA. It's an, an educational non-profit organisation and it helps utilities to deploy and integrate solar, storage, demand response and other distributed energy resources. Several years ago, SEPA kicked off the 51st State Initiative in the US. I think sometimes we think of ourselves as the 51st state, but this is the real version. And it was a unique project which asked people the question, what would you do if you could create the perfect energy market from scratch? If you could uh, not have to deal with legacy infrastructure and you were unhindered by the existing market design. The idea of a 51st state is very liberating. So considering what we would do with a clean sheet of paper, it gives us the freedom to look beyond the here and now, beyond the current constraints and realities, towards a broader vision of the future. And the real strength in the exercise is that it allows us to define where we would like to get to and gives us a path to planning the future, and particularly how solar and utility industry transactions could look in that future. 
I'm really delighted to welcome Julia here. She's the President and CEO of SEPA and uh, is uh, gracing us here today. I know she's on vacation as well, but she's coming here today uh, to talk to us as part of the CSB Power in the Future lecture series. She has more than 15 years' experience advising and collaborating with utilities, manufacturers, government agencies, uh, etc., on renewable energy and energy efficiency strategy and programs. She's one of the world's foremost experts on the nexus between utilities and distributed energy resources. She has expertise on the business models and solar programs for more than 400 utilities in the US, which fascinates me because I'm having trouble with one, but <laughs> <laughs> as well as utilities in Europe and Asia. Prior to joining SEPA, she worked for ICF International, where she supported the implementation of the Energy Star program. She's a graduate of Cornell University, and she also walks the talk, living in a PV-powered, energy-efficient home in Northern Virginia. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Julia Hahn. So this year, my husband and I both turned 40, and so we decided earlier this year that we were going to go somewhere that we had never been before. We've traveled the world uh, throughout our 15 years together, but we've never been to Iceland. So we decided in May to get on a plane and go to Iceland, do something we had never done, and we decided we were going to go ice climbing on a glacier. And so we spent this day with two guides who took us up onto the glacier, and we started, you know, put on our crampons and our climbing gear, and we started going up and down these little ice walls. And it was fun. We were having a great time. We sort of felt like we were, knew what we were doing. Uh, it was, it's a very repetitive process. You just keep, sort of keep doing the same thing over and over with your arms and your feet. And then sort of at the end of the day, we're exhausted. And then the guides tell us, we're going to take you over here, and we're going to go down this giant crevasse, and you're going to climb out on the other side. This is me climbing out. But as I was on the top on the other side, I froze. And I couldn't figure out why. And I thought, I've been doing this all day. I can do this. This one's bigger. It's deeper. There's sort of a hole at the bottom that goes into the middle of Earth. But I can do this. <laughs> so I climbed down. I got across. And then I got to the bottom again. And I froze again. And I really was like literally paralyzed in fear. And as I thought about why was I paralyzed in fear, I think it was really because it was a long day. We were tired. And I didn't know what was on the other side of that wall. I didn't know whether we were going to get to the other side of the wall and it was going to be an easy walk down and we were going to go back to the bus, or I didn't know if there was going to be another crevasse just like this one on the other side that I was going to have to climb again, and another one after that, and another one after that. I just didn't know what was on the other side of the wall. So what does this have to do with what I'm here to talk to you about today? Well, it, interestingly, as we embarked upon this 51st state exercise two years ago, I've been traveling the country ever since in the US talking about it. And I've been talking the entire time about, about, the, oops, about the BFW, the big frickin' wall. And I now have my own real BFW experience. And there's a really a clear parallel in terms of what I've been talking about with the 51st state and the big frickin' wall and my own experience. And that's as we think about the electric utility industry. In the US, we've been talking for probably five, six years now about the utility of the future. But what is the utility of the future? There is no clear definition of what that is. And so if we think about sort of as utilities in the US who are over here, and you think about, okay, if we make little incremental changes, maybe we can get to here. But we think we need to be over here Either we need to be over here because our regulators or policymakers or our customers are telling us we need to be or we think we need to be. The problem is between where you can get with those little incremental changes and to over here to where you need to be, there's this big frickin' wall in the middle. And you don't know what actually is on the other side of that wall. So this is really sort of the whole design of the 51st state in terms of how do you, first, how do you figure out what's on the other side of the wall? How do you create a common vision for what, obviously there could be multiple visions, but how do you define what those might look like? And then what are the steps you need to take to get to the wall and then get over the wall, under the wall, through the wall, somehow to get to the other side? So I'm gonna just play for you a quick video here. is an undeniable aspect of nature. Technology and ideas are constantly evolving. Society is changing too, as we look towards a sustainable future. This evolution in the electricity marketplace and the rise of renewables 
can leave established utilities, industry, and consumers wondering where they fit as we move forward. That's why there's the 51st State. We start in a new safe space beyond existing paradigms and current market structures. It's a platform for innovation, building on the best ideas and business models to create multiple roadmaps for the future. This is a structured conversation that includes all stakeholders, from the companies that make and install hardware and software, to the electricity providers who deliver the power, and even the consumers who use it. There are multiple solutions for the future, and the 51st state champions the premise that everyone can win. We've attracted the brightest minds and thought-provoking ideas to the 51st state. Now it's up to all of us to turn these ideas into realistic, functional roadmaps. Utilities, industry, and consumers are all invited to help construct the electricity market of the future. It's now up to you. For more information, visit SEPA51.org. back to 2013 in the U.S. in Arizona, we started to see extremely heated debates uh, between the local utilities and the local and national solar installers, uh, really around, primarily around rate design issues. And it, it got to the point and honestly continues to be um, not a constructive conversation in that state. People on both sides um, really have, their, have had their heels dug in. They have their entrenched, entrenched interest, interests that they're trying to protect. Um, and it's been challenging to, to move things forward in a constructive way for anyone um, in that state in particular. So back when those conversations in Arizona, or I wouldn't even call them conversations, when, when the, that discourse sort of started in Arizona in 2013, um, our organization started talking about what can we do to help? Uh, we are a neutral, unbiased nonprofit organization. Half of our membership are electric utilities, half are technology companies and government agencies and others that have an interest in collaborating with utilities. So we said, what could we do to help? Um, in our organization, it's not our nature to go into a specific state and try to solve their problems. It's just not what we historically have done. So we decided we did not want to get involved specifically in what was happening in Arizona, but we wanted to do something that would help the conversations in other states be more constructive in nature. So we started talking about, well, okay, so Arizona is very heated. The conversations are ugly. Uh, what if we went to another state like Mississippi, where in 2013 there was essentially zero solar at that point? Could we pull together all of the stakeholders in Mississippi to have a constructive conversation about what changes could be made uh, in order to um, optimize distributed energy resources? And for us, it's, about, it's not about maximizing, it's about optimizing. Uh, but as our, as our team talked about it, what we came to realize was it would be extremely difficult to do in Arizona because of the state of the industry, but it would still be very hard to do in Mississippi, even though there was no solar already in place, just because of the 100 years of the electric, uh, electric utility business. Um, it would still be very hard to make progress other than very incremental changes. So that led us to, well, what if we just made up a state? Let's make up a 51st state. So that was where the idea of this blank slate 51st state came from. And we've designed, I'm gonna tell you a little bit sort of about the process of the initiative, and then we'll talk about some of the uh, takeaways that we've got up until this point and where we're gonna go from here. Uh, but we've designed the initiative in a phased approach. The first phase uh, was a year-long process between the fall of 2014 and the fall of 2015, where we went out to the US uh, energy industry and essentially crowdsourced visions for the future. So we went out, we said, if, if you had this blank 51st state, what would you do with it? What would your vision be? How would you design things? So uh, we gave the industry a few months to develop their visions and put pen to paper, and we got about 15 or 16 submissions of what we call con vision concept papers. And they came from a whole variety of perspectives. Um, everyone from the trade associations for the municipal utilities and the rural electric co-ops to 
a former federal regulator to former state regulators to university research centers, technology company executives, so all of these different people, uh, thought leaders in the industry with different perspectives, all articulated their visions for the future. And then we spent six months uh, going around the country, convening forums to talk about those variety of visions and really just creating this safe space for people to have what is normally a very contentious and uncomfortable conversation because it was all theoretical. We were talking about this theoretical, hypothetical 51st state. We were not talking about anyone's individual service territory or state. So it really created this great environment for people to be comfortable thinking outside the box, talking about what could be possible and not getting so focused in on what our current constraints are today. So this was the first phase of the initiative. And really, with the concepts that were submitted, we put them into two primary buckets. Um, we had a handful uh, that were essentially saying, listen, today's market, th there's no one market design in the US. I'm sure most of you know there are many different designs. But uh, people who are saying, generally, the market designs that we have work. We just need to tweak some things in order to be able to optimize DER. But we don't need this wholesale shift. It's just little tweaks to what we've currently got. And then we had a whole nother set of visions submitted that said, no, we need a paradigm shift. We completely need to have change how we run this industry. Um, so it really created this great opportunity to talk about different people's perspectives and, and why we had these two very different uh, positions. And then, so in the fall of 2015, we then launched the second phase, and which was also a year long process. So the second phase, we went back out to the industry and said, we've now spent a year talking about all of these potential visions. Now let's get more specific and we want people to create roadmaps for how do we get from where we are today to your vision of the future. So similarly, it was another crowdsourced effort. We had 15 or 16 submissions, again, of roadmaps, some from people who had submitted visions in the first phase, but others were new participants. Uh, but one of the things that we did that was very critical was creating a, a framework for the roadmap process. Because one of the things that we've seen, as I, as I pointed to in Arizona, the conversation has gotten very narrowly focused on, on rate design. And you know, our concern is if we're really trying to think long term how this industry is evolving, we need to think more holistically about not just rate design, but the utility business model, how regulation is, is uh, handled, what IT, what IT infrastructure changes are going to be needed, what changes need to be made to the retail market, to the wholesale market. All of these different things need to be taken into consideration holistically and not just narrowly focused in on any one piece of that equation. Because if you're too focused in on just one piece, ultimately you're going to have unintended consequences with those other pieces if you haven't laid them all out, again, collectively uh, towards your vision. So uh, the road mapping process went well, similar to the first phase. We spent six months following the submission of the roadmaps, going around the country, having conversations at various industry forums about the roadmaps. Um, and now we're really to the point of uh, our team spent this summer sort of digesting the past two years of what we've learned, what we've heard, uh, what were in the submissions, but also what was the dialogue that we've had now with hundreds of thought leaders across the industry in the U.S. and come away with essentially um, four what we're calling doctrines. So we were really looking for the common ground. Rather than focusing on where people disagree, which there's plenty of places people disagree, where are the places where we can get agreement at a high level that can be served, serve as the basis for constructive conversations state by state going forward? So four doctrines. So the first one is really around market efficiency. You know, that the primary goal of the market should be to promote efficiencies in the production, consumption, and investment in energy and related technologies. Um, now, some of the things that we see or could see happen that support this obviously would be investments in energy efficiency, uh, investments in distribution automation, uh, a greater focus on distribution system uh, resource planning. And that really is becoming a much larger focus in the US just over the past 12 months, 12 to 18 months. We're now seeing a number of states where uh, either driven by the utility or by policymakers where the expectation is that the distribution utilities need to have a much deeper and sophisticated understanding of the system. So whether that's 
uh, understanding the hosting capacity of every individual feeder in terms of how much distributed energy resources could go onto that feeder um, at, sort of without any investments in upgrading the feeder or the system, um, or what, what levels would trigger additional investments, uh, but really much more um, sophisticated understanding of the distribution, distribution system. And today we've got about 50% of US households have smart meters, um, but smart, so we still have half the country that does not have smart meters, uh, but even the half that does, we haven't yet fully understood um, all of the capabilities that um, advanced metering infrastructure can deliver back to the utility, to the entire system, and to individual customers. So we really need to, to work on, and continue to work on making sure that we're um, leveraging those smart meter, smart infrastructure assets to deliver value back to both the system level and the end consumer. Uh, at grid modernization generally is a huge focus in the U.S. right now. There's $32 billion in grid modernization investment that's expected by U.S. utilities this year. Uh, and that is uh, a huge focus of most of the utility, or many of the utility filings that are going into commissions this year uh, are requests for investment in grid modernization efforts. So the first doctrine really around market efficiency. The second is around the, the clear definition of roles going forward, specifically for utilities but other market players. So there is no single agreement on what the utility of the future will look like, as we've talked about. Uh, but we do think that there is agreement among stakeholders that, that, that there needs to be an explicit conversation in each state in the United States about what that role will look like. Uh, the end result may be different in different places. But we should be talking about, you know, in places where the utility in the U.S. is still vertically integrated, will it remain vertically integrated? Or is it going to move to a DSO model, a distribution system operator, a distri distribution system platform? Um, in New York, they have a massive proceeding happening called Reforming the Energy Vision, REV, um, and that is focused on moving the ut utilities towards a, just a system platform model. So essentially, they're creating the platform where others can plug and play into the distribution system. Um, they also are, uh, there, there's a lot of components to the Reforming the Energy Vision proceeding, but, but an important piece of it uh, that ties back to this idea of defining the roles is also about defining the business model and the revenue streams for the utility. So as part of that, uh, they're still working through the details, but essentially the utilities in New York will now be able to earn revenue in four different ways. One is the traditional cost of service model. Uh, the second is achievement of alternatives that reduce ca utility capital spending and return value to customers. The third is by the utility creating market-facing platforms, so creating the platform for those third parties to, to uh, engage in the distribution system. And then the fourth is moving towards, um, similar to the UK, moving towards more outcome-based performance measures. And so the utility can earn on efficiency investments. Uh, they can earn on uh, the, I'm not quite sure how they're going to do this, but uh, the satisfaction of the industry and customers related to interconnection of DER to the system. Um, and also, they can earn on customer engagement. So again, I'm not quite sure how they're going to measure this. Uh, but, there, but to really look at customer choice, um, how many customers are engaging in new innovative programs that the utilities are offering. So essentially, they're, they're really redefining uh, the utility business model and the definition of the role of the utility in New York as one example. They are definitely looked at in the United States as on the bleeding edge of all of this transition. Um, some states are interest, some states and some utilities are interested in following their lead. Others are um, maybe not, they're looking at them with, through a little different lens, um, thinking that they are crazy to be taking on what they're taking. Uh, but, but again, we'll see how it all plays out over time. So the second doctrine was a clear definition of roles. The third doctrine is around rate structures and really helping to uh, rethink, and this conversation is already happening everywhere in the US. Everyone is looking to redesign their rate structures. Uh, but there certainly is not agreement on what the right rate model is. Uh, in the US, the majority of utility rate structures are um, primarily volumetric at this point. 
um, and lo obviously looking to ensure as, as more and more customers are generating their own power, their own electricity, uh, ensuring that the, the rate structures are designed in a way that we can still maintain and, and upgrade the grid as needed uh, for all customers' benefit. So uh, a lot of things happening, a lot of conversation around our time of use rates, the right way to go, is it residential demand charges, is it fixed charges, um, and most certainly no agreement on that. Uh, we're seeing some momentum in the U.S. From, the ut from utilities. Going back two years ago, most utilities were talking about fixed charges. We've seen a little bit of a shift just over the past couple of years or so, uh, more conversation around potentially going to residential demand charges, but certainly um, no, no uh, general agreement yet and what direction people are going to go. Going back to Arizona, if you look at Arizona Public Service, which is the largest investor in utility in the state, uh, they actually, it's interesting because they're, they're the ones in the middle of this controversy more than anyone, um, and especially around rate design. And yet they actually have 120,000 of their customers who for a long time have been on a rate structure that is a combination of time of use and demand. So they, they actually have a significant portion of their customers that before these debates even started happening around clean energy, about or around rooftop solar particularly, or, or, uh, or storage within residential customers' homes, um, already had customer acceptance of this idea of this three-part rate structure that included time of use and a demand charge. Uh, but yet the, the solar industry and, and there's no one solar industry in the U.S. There's many factions that have very different perspectives. Uh, but the, the national solar leasing companies that are focused pretty much exclusively on the solar market uh, are very opposed to uh, utilities having residential demand charges. Um, at the same time, it's interesting because uh, they're locally, more of the solar installers are beginning to also offer storage in combination with solar. And so that part of the industry is saying, no, 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 we like demand charges. This makes storage much more appealing. Um, so it's this very interesting dialogue happening uh, to try and figure out what is the right rate structure and not just focusing on today's technologies, but what are the technologies that are coming? So we need to be careful that we're in the US that we're not so focused just on rooftop solar because that's the hot thing right now but we know storage is coming very fast and EVs are coming very fast and other things are coming. So when you think about all of those things together, what is the optimal rate design um, in order to make sure that the utility has what it needs but customers are also getting what they need? So the rate structure uh, conversation is sort of the third piece of that. The fourth is really around customer choice. Um, as throughout our two years of conversations on these issues, clearly, um, customer education and customer choice has been a, a loud theme um, that's come through all the conversations. And ensuring that customers have choice, both in terms of rate designs, so not all customers are the same, they don't want the same things, um, but that they have choice in terms of rate designs, but also program options. Um, and you know, part of it is thinking about the changing expectations of customers, consumers generally today. You know, as we see the younger generations who have their smartphone, they expect real-time information on their phone to pull up an app on anything in their life at any point in time, and that, trans and that they want to be able to make choices about that right from their phone. And that translates or will translate into expectations from their electric utilities or their energy provider, whoever it might be. Uh, but not every customer is that way. So we need to be thinking about this general changing consumer dynamic but also know that there are always going to be people who don't want to think about their energy at all. They just want the basic service. They just want the standard option, and that needs to be available to them. So how do you think? Of, how do you begin to segment your customers in a way in which you're creating options across the customer base? But for those customers who want choice, you're also providing them a lot of choice. One thing that's interesting in the U.S. We've talked about customer choice for a long time, for decades. But historically, it's really been around retail choice, you know, the ability of a customer to be able to choose whether they want their electricity provided by the traditional monopoly utility or by some third party. So Texas now has complete retail choice as, as an example. Customers can choose who they want to provide their electricity to them. So we used to talk about that as customer choice. 
But it, we're now shifting, I think. That's part of the conversation. But customers want choice, even, even if they only have their single monopoly utility option, they want choice from that utility. And so we've seen with the, the JD Power um, surveys in the US that utilities that offer their customers choice have much higher customer satisfaction, even if the customers don't actually choose any of those choices, they stay with whatever the default is, they, per, they have much higher satisfaction with their utility if the utility is offering, offering choices to them and they know they're available. So creating this customer choice is the, the fourth key piece of all of this. So in terms of going forward, um, you know, we've been digesting these four doctrines as, as the wrap up of phase two. We're now headed into the third phase of the 51st state. And the third phase, so in phase one and two, it was all theoretical. It was all this fictional 51st state. Phase three is really where the rubber meets the road. Um, and we are actively looking for a real state in the US uh, where the stakeholders want to work through the same process that we've been through with the hypothetical 51st state. So we're looking for a state where the governor, the energy office, the utilities, the environmental NGOs, the entire community is interested in coming together and having a, a long-term facilitated conversation, first to create a collective vision for the state going forward, and then to create a roadmap on how they're gonna get there. Uh, so this is, this is the exciting part, uh, but our hope would be we've created a framework in which we can begin to replicate this, either led by us or led by others, uh, begin to replicate this in various states throughout the country uh, to really help create some order out of what for many feels like chaos right now. Uh, there's so much going on, it's hard to keep track of all of the pieces, but this really sort of putting it into a framework where it's, there's a very clear process that people are working through and it's very stakeholder focused, making sure that all of the right stakeholders have a part in the conversation. Uh, because we believe if everybody works together uh, to define the vision of the future and lay out all of the steps, then that wall, that big freaking wall becomes much less scary and we can all get there easier together. Thank you.